Hi, everyone. So I want to say hi, Carolyn, Car Caroline, Christian, Jennifer, and Natasha. Thanks for joining us. We're going to reverse the order of the agenda. Um, Manon Frenette from the ministry wanted to uh, start the webinar with a few announcements. She's having trouble connecting to VIA. So when she finally is able to connect, we'll let her take the floor. If she doesn't give up entirely. <laughs> Uh, today's, okay, today's topic, the PowerPoint presentation didn't work, so it's in PDF. The only difference really being that uh, my animations won't show up and they just make it cute. So today we're going in depth on, um, we're going in depth with regard to the webinar that we did with Professor Cobb. I, I realized that one was particularly dense. He covered a lot of material in the two hours. So I felt it was beneficial if we went through it step by step and we take our time and, and you can ask questions or and we can explore it together. Uh, this is part one out of two. The next one will be in March. I don't have the date on hand for the, the next webinar, but I'll be giving out an email. So don't worry about missing that date. Okay, so we are recapitulating um, what Professor Cobb said about the theory of vocabulary in ESL. And I have to admit, when I started teaching, I even took a course that qualified me to teach ESL uh, as a second language, and I didn't learn any of this. So there are several parts that were new to me, and uh, it was really great to hear him give the statistics. So in this first section, we'll compare the old theory versus the new theory uh, in terms of research so that we understand why teaching vocabulary is important when we're learning a second language. The old theory was that researchers and teachers probably believed uh, learners would acquire the necessary vocabulary like they did in their first language. Um, but nobody really realized it takes 15 years to learn the vocabulary in your first language, both implicitly and explicitly. And in your second language, if you're taking the, a class to go to university, or in our case, our students are getting their high school diploma, they don't have 15 years. So there was an issue there. And uh, they discovered that vocabulary learning uh, takes up a large portion of all of the language elements that a, a learner needs in order to be functional in that language. And that's the consensus of several meta-analysis meta analysis studies. So it's studies that are done uh, across spectrums with very large quantities of data. And that is what they discovered. So here's my comparison with the paleo diet. I've never done the paleo diet, but uh, as you can see here, 50% of what a person should eat if they're on that diet is made up of vegetables, which uh, many nutritionists will tell you is it can, you can never go wrong with eating that much fresh vegetables. Similarly, when we look at all of the language objectives, according to the new research, what a learner needs to be functional, 50% or more is vocabulary and that's what Dr. Cobb said in his webinar. I found that striking so I, I thought this visual would be good because that's a significant amount. The other 50% is a combination of grammar, fluency, pronunciation and all of those other elements that we also find important. So that was just to emphasize the degree that vocabulary takes um, for a language learner to be functional. In this section, naturally, like me, you're probably thinking, well, that's great. Uh, there's a lot of vocabulary. English has around a million words. So, I mean, what do I teach and how and when and where? Uh, let's look at the needs before we look at the, the how, the what, the when and the where. So a learner, uh, it needs to know roughly 90% of the first 2,000 words in order to speak and to watch TV. And for reading, 
They need to know more than 75% of the first 2,000. Um, so I, more than 75, I would just gauge it at 80% to be safe. Uh, you might even go higher, like 85%. So what are the first 2,000 most frequently occurring words? How do we know what that means? We'll get into that in just a second. So out of the million words in the English language, um, just to read and to watch TV, 90% roughly of the first 2,000, between 90 to 80%. Um, and then I'm going to quote what Dr. Cobb said, where he says that roughly it's 2,500 words in order to be functional. So it's it's not a precise quantity, but give or take, it's somewhere in 2,000, 2,500, somewhere between 80% to 90%. I go with 80, with 2,500, because that's what he said in the webinar. Uh, just understand it's not cut and dry, but it's within that range, as, as you can deduce, it's still a high percentage. Who determines what are the most frequently com uh, most frequently occurring words in English how, how do we know what they are? How do we find documents like that and things like that? Uh, so this is actually older research done in 1953. A teacher called Michael West, who was also a researcher, he compiled a list, a list of the most, uh, the words, the first 2,000 words that came up the most often. So what he did was he took a collection of texts and he sorted out and found the words that occurred the most frequently. Uh, the word the would be a good guess as to one that would show up often. And, uh, who, but, so questions like that. And they get increasingly more complex um, as the more often that uh, they show up. Uh, then in 2013, some researchers they updated the list and they updated it by using a, a larger collection of texts to refer from. So that's called a corpus. And they used 273 million. So they, sorry, let me rephrase that. They anal analyzed 273 million words from a large variety of texts called the Cambridge English Corpus. So it's a, a collection of words from documents made for native speakers. This document is called the New General Service List. I have a copy of one for you. Just out of interest, I'm going to share my screen and show it to you. It will be in the documents um, that you can find on the APRICOR website. And uh, by the way, all of these documents will be in the Bibliothèque section. Richard will upload them there. So just out of interest, you can see here, here they explain just a little bit of the history. And here they have a, a nice little instructional guide on the different ways you can use this list for your teaching purposes. Uh, the first one, translating words into the first language. Uh, that's something that I have been working on since I saw the webinar with Dr. Cobb. And the very last slide of this presentation, I will show you what I've done and I will share what I've done. So just very quickly, so you can see that the 176 most frequently occurring word in English is kind and they get increasingly complex as you go higher in frequency. So the 1,451st most frequently occurring word in English is convince. And it goes so on and so forth. Something I should note is that these lists, depending on who made them, vary a little bit. And when I show you the work that I've been doing, uh, I will explain why there's a bit of repetition. Something also to note is that when we talk about the most frequently occurring words in English, they're grouped into bands of a thousand. Uh, and the abbreviation for a thousand in English is the letter K. So they call them K bands. And when we explore Lex Tutor in part two, 
when we talk about K1 and K2 and K3 and so forth, that's what we mean, the first thousand most frequently common uh, occurring words, second thousand, et cetera. That's just a little bit of vocabulary to, uh, to keep in mind on that website. Okay, so uh, in these word lists that I just showed you, um, those are words called headwords. And what a headword is, is like in the dictionary, for example, the word go. Uh, as you read in the dictionary, you'll see further that there will be derivatives of go, such as going, will go, went. So uh, participle forms, past, future forms, but also conjugations of like first person, second person, and third person. So those are the derivative forms. According to Dr. Cobb, students to be functional in their second language need 2,500, the knowledge of 2,500 word families. So when we say word families, we mean head word, like go, plus all of the derivative forms. Just something to keep in note. Uh, at the end of the presentation, when I show you the project, I'll explain how I accommodated head words versus the derivative forms. Okay, in the last section, we talked about which words we're talking about, frequently occurring words. We talked about the general service list and the new general service list. The fact that, that depending on who put the list together and which corpora or which collections of texts that they use, there could be some difference between them. It's really not that big of a deal. And the fact that when we talk about frequently occurring words, we are referring to the head word, but it's understood that its derivative forms are also included in that, and they're together, head words and derivative forms are called word families. In this section, uh, we're going to look at three vocabulary tests that a teacher can use in his or her classroom. Uh, Dr. Cobb also mentioned that the teacher is welcome to make their own. I think it's a great idea, but I'm not sure how many teachers would have time to make up their own vocabulary lists, but it is an option if you're interested in knowing what he said about that. I invite you to review that section of the webinar, or you can send me an email and I will show you the resources he had talked about for making your own vocabulary tests. I found them on his website. To keep things simple, I thought it would be more useful if we could just go through the tests, some tests that uh, are already made. So the first test that he talked about is on uh, his LexTutor website. You go in the tests section and out of interest when we did the pilot project with him and myself and two other teachers we tested our students for their vocabulary levels this was the test that we used so it's called vocabulary size tests it's digital i you could print this there's a print feature right here and this test as you can see goes all the way to 14k or the 14,000th most commonly uh, most frequently occurring words i would suggest since students really just need the first 2500 word families to be functional to perhaps go to the fifth thousand most common and uh, most frequently occurring words uh, if you want maybe even go to the first third thousand, which is this gray section here. The choice is up to yours. So the student, you know, puts in their answers. Of course, I'm just randomly choosing here. No, nope, sorry, don't scroll down to the bottom. Hmm, now why can't I submit my answers? I'm going to refresh. And then you just press score, you click OK. If your student wishes to remain anonymous, this test is recorded on Dr. On Dr. Cobb's uh, website for everyone to see. They can put in a fictitious name, or if they don't care, they can put in their real name. So then you click OK. 
I did really well on this test. Uh, you can click to see the results here. And that's me right there. Now, as you can see, I need some help. If you can't find your student's name, here is the IP address of the computer that the student used. And all you have to do is go back to the home page. And you can see there's my IP address. So that's another way you can find the student's results. This particular test also has a practice mode, which Dr. Cobb recommended the student use after to practice word definitions. What I like about the practice mode is it tells me right here my results. So it tells me, now I just randomly guessed, but it tells me that in K2, so the second thousand most frequently occurring words in English, I know 10% of them. It tells me right down here what level to work at. I'm not sure why it's not displaying right now. There we go. It says I should work, obviously, at the first, uh, first thousand most frequently occurring words. Something to keep in mind with this test is when you get your student to click on the yellow score button, I've had some students lose their data and this is kind of discouraging for them because they took the time to do the test. So you might want to save it in a PDF form and then check the answers or enter them in at a different time. At least you have a hard copy. That is a little time consuming um, I admit. On the other hand, uh, it's a little disappointing to have them take the test and spend their time only to lose their results. Uh, something else that we did when we gave this as a pilot project is we gave a time limit and we limited their resources. So no consulting translation devices, no dictionaries, uh, no consulting their friends. Because it's a diagnostic, we wanted to know what they knew, not what they could find out by asking. So that is the first test, vocabulary size test. The link to this test, it's, it's an online test, but you can print it. It will be in the bibliotheque section of the uh, Apricor website. And I just need to get back to my main screen. Perfect. In the next section, going to look at the second test uh, that, that you, you as a teacher you could use with your students. So this is called the new vocabulary levels test. Now I'm going to share my screen again. I have the paper version. Uh, this one has an online version as well. It only goes to the fifth thousand most frequently occurring words. The online version uh, you have to answer all of the questions in order to get your results. Whereas the paper version, if you only wanted your students to do up to the first third thousand, you have that option. So that's why the paper one is nice. I will say, I think the definitions are a little bit easier in this one for a student to understand, but how it works, for example, here, you have your word cost, and you have to put in X, or a mark in the box that responds to the word cost. Same with picture, same with place where things grow outside. And included, I have for you, is a correction key. We'll talk about to analyze the results in a little minute here. How long did you give to do the test? Perfect, great question. I gave one hour. And in one hour, it was evident which levels the students, um, at what levels they, they knew or they didn't. Um, for example, some of my students went up to probably the first 12,000. These would be the bilingual students. The other students who had to go through the normal courses to learn English, um, these ones, they probably only made it up to the first third thousand. And that just reminds me, the other thing, if you are interested in giving this test to your students, uh, I would say is encourage them to use strategies to guess the meaning as opposed to just 
randomly guessing because everybody knows with multiple choice, there is a certain percentage they could get right by closing their eyes and guessing. So uh, I also reminded them that it's a diagnostic test. There will be words they will not understand. So to understand uh, that they shouldn't expect to get everything right. Um, that way I'm, I'm setting the expectation there so they don't get discouraged. Okay, did I answer your question? Thank you, Carolyn, for your question. Great. Okay, um, let me pull up my webinar document. In the last section, we talked about the new vocabulary levels test. In this section, I will go over the new general service list test. Okay, okay. this one is similar to the first test we talked about, the vocabulary size test. Uh, similar in the sense that you have a word, you have a sentence that gives it a bit of context, not a lot of context, and then you have to find the synonym. This, te this test goes up to the third thousand frequently occurring words, so it's the right size, but this one is oh, it's divided into three levels so that it corresponds with uh, the Lex Tutor website, which we will get into in part two in March. This one did not have a correction key. So on the weekend, just for everybody in the network, I made you a correction key. So here are the answers. But something to notice is I was using my keyboard when I put in the answers and I noticed I kind of missed one or two questions and I was at question 20, but my answers were at question 21, for example. So I went back and I had to see which questions I missed. So if you see any errors like that in the test, please just let me know. I apologize in advance. I will be happy to correct that for you and publish the updated version. Uh, that does happen. So here I put in a guide for the score results. Uh, I will talk about that in just a minute. And then we'll come back to that. So in the last section, we looked at three different vocabulary tests. All have paper versions. Some have online versions. They all have correction keys. It's really a question of preference for the teacher or preference for the student or for both. Uh, whoever wants to use whichever one, they are welcome to. They will all be listed in the bibliotheque section. In this section, we'll look at how to analyze the results based on what Dr. Cobb said in the last webinar uh, in terms of the general principle of what a student needs to be functional in their second language, but also uh, what do they need to be independent learners. So we're going to look at that. So oh, great, I have a question. Do the levels correspond with our current secondary levels? Martin, that is an excellent question. What I will say is we're, we're not clear yet on which levels correspond with our secondary program, but it is something we're working on. There's a general working theory, but I would rather give a, con a, give a confirmation when it's more clearly understood. So to answer your question, I would say not yet, not a definitive answer. It's definitely something that I will consult with the team about. And when we have a definitive answer, I would be more than happy to let everyone know. Does that satisfy your question? It's, it's a question that was asked in the last webinar and it's a question on all of our minds. Um, so it's something that we have to understand with the program what is the expected vocabulary for each level and what does that mean in terms of uh, Tom Cobb's framework in terms of where would a student be in our program, in our framework, at the 2500 level, the functional level. So great. Yes, excellent question. Certainly a priority question. We will get back to you um, about that as soon as possible. 
speaking of results and what do they mean for us in our program, that part is forthcoming. In the meantime, what I realized when I was listening to Dr. Cobb was, regardless of which level my students are in, according to the research, my students would be struggling more if they didn't have a solid basis in these first 2,500 words. So I have to admit it took a bit of realization and adjustment for me in terms of the focus wouldn't be so much are they level two versus level three, but more do they have a solid foundation in vocabulary which will help them to move faster through whatever level they're in. As a side note, when I explain this project to my students, you might find it interesting to know that one of them, all she wanted to do was concentrate on her learning situations for her secondary three level, because she just wanted to finish, and I'm sure you all have students like that. But I explained to her what research says about having a basis in vocabulary, and that even if she were to spend 20 minutes per English class, just working on her vocabulary, according to research, that would help her move through her courses. Then she agreed. She still gave me this skeptical look, but she agreed to do it. So the very last slide, we'll talk about what I'm doing in class. But before we get to that, so let's imagine you have given your student the vocabulary test, you've got your results, like in Lex Tutor, there's just a a line of data, K1 equals K2 equals, etc. Well, what do you do with this information? That's a really good question. And when I did this with my students, they asked me, what does all of this mean? And I thought to myself, oh, that is a good question. So the first thing you do is let's say that you have a score, for example, 17 out of 20. You convert it to a percentage. That will just help you to understand uh, what to do with the score. So, like we talked about at the beginning of the slideshow, the student needs 90%, they need to know 90% of the first 2,000 words to speak or watch TV, and more than 75% of the first 2,000 most frequently occurring words in order to read. So I, instead of more than 75, I chose 85 here, but you could work with 80. Like I had mentioned, it's not a cut in stone statistic. It's to be used more as a guide. So considering that 85% is the guideline that I chose to keep things simple, your student would need to know 85% of the first thousand words, 85% of the second thousand words, and because Dr. Cobb said to be functional, to have a basis, they need to know 2,500, 2,500 word families. You could argue half of the third thousand word to make 2,500. So I have two example, um, let me get my pointer. I have two example scenarios here. So my first student scored 32% in K1. That means that out of a thousand words, they know 32% of the first thousand most frequently occurring words. They know 20% of the, for the second thousand most frequently occurring words, and they know 58% of the third thousand most frequently occurring words. So what does this tell you about vocabulary instruction? If this were your student, do they need vocabulary instruction, yes or no? And if they do, at what level would you start them at? If you want to type in your answers or use the hand signal. Okay. So everybody, thank you, Christian. Everyone has a great understanding of how this works. That's great. K3, student two, okay. Yes, um, because they only know 32% of the first thousand the logical choice would be to start them at the first thousand and have them work their way up. Question for you, why do you think this student scored higher in K3 when presumably those words, they might be more difficult in 
complexity for English compared to K1, where you'll see words like and, but, the, uh, d sorry, I didn't mean that, the, or a. Any idea? More thematic vocabulary words. That's an excellent guess, especially if they're paying attention in class. Learning situations, same idea, excellent guess. Like Dr. Cobb said, sometimes these words are more cognates. Okay, Christian, you have an excellent memory. That's precisely it. The first, so K1 and K2, the first and second most thousand words are of Anglo-Saxon origin. So these are words that are the least similar to languages that originate in Greek or Latin, such as French. K3, 4, 5, you will see more English words that have been borrowed or adapted from French or similar languages. So strangely, a French speaking student will typically score higher in those levels. So yes, that's exactly it, great. Let's look at student two. First thousand words, student scores 95%. Second thousand, student scores 80%. Third thousand, student scores 50%. So. Do you think the student needs to have vocabulary instruction, yes or no? And if so, what level would you start the student at? Okay, K2, thank you, Jennifer. Rishar says no. Melissa says no. Carolyn says three. Okay, so it's clear by your answers that the way to interpret this, um, it, it's clear to everybody. So that's excellent. 95 for level one, probably not. Level two, that's where I said earlier, it really depends on the teacher if they want to push the student to have a higher understanding. Whereas if they're fine with 80%, uh, level three, it depends again, if we're considering what Dr. Cobb said about having a basis of 2,500 words, according to this test, it appears that they've met that requirement. So no, they might not need it if they're okay using resources like a dictionary or uh, other kinds of reading strategies and things like that. On the other hand, if they want to go to an English university, in those kinds of contexts, it might be a good option to push them. It's variable, so all of those answers are correct. Okay, I think this is very clear, very great. We have just enough time to talk about what I'm doing in my class. Um, I will be updating you as I go along. This is a work in progress. Um, so we're, my students and I, the ones that are not bilingual, the ones that are not prior learning candidates, are working just on our basis of the first thousand most frequently occurring words. How are we doing this? Well. Dr. Cobb mentioned a few resources like flashcards and intensive reading. I'm looking into those kinds of resources, but I find in my class, I like to use digital resources for two reasons. One, the students like digital activities, and two, it's something autonomous. They can do it on their own. I can check up on them and do a follow-up, but I don't have to be there at the moment working with every single student. So this frees me up to work with other students on other activities. So I looked uh, in a uh, digital platform called Quizlet. I looked in uh, the uh, Smart Exchange for Smart Board Activities. I didn't really find what I was looking for. If you, if you refer to my previous slide, just one second here. Um, I showed you the new general service list and I mentioned the first instructional strategy in a, a list of I think six or seven tips that they had and it said translating these words into the student's first language. So I manually typed each one out and I found the French translation and I have happily the first thousand words available to my students to work with in Quizlet. Now, I forgot to pull that up, so I'm going to pull that up right now for you. And I know we're kind of running out of time, so I'm going to just really cram this in here. 
and show you what I'm doing. I will give you the link so that you are welcome to use these resources and uh, provide feedback, especially with my translation, because the translation was done by a computer algorithm. And then me not being a, an expert in French, I chose the one that I thought was best. But honestly, I would love feedback from other teachers who are stronger in French than me. So here's what I have. I have the free trial version of Quizlet Teacher which has some nice features. So right now my students are doing 20 minutes to 60 minutes and they can start by reviewing their flashcards. So I group them in 100 and they just go through it. I let them work with their friends and they try to guess the meanings. Now my original set was made by a different teacher and there were some mistakes in the French so the students they had fun finding the mistakes in French. The teacher version has some other activities. So for example, the learn one, you, it, it reinforces the introduction to the definition. So for example, they have to find the correct word and they go on, so on and so forth. There is some kind of uh, competitive feature so they can compete against each other, which I think they will enjoy. I haven't gotten there yet. Um, what I like about this being digital, so I, I do work with them when I do a follow-up. I ask them which words were new to them and I ask them to listen to it so that we're reinforcing it. Again, it's a work in progress with getting there. This is what we're starting with, but by no means is this how we're finishing. So I just want to get back to my screen, sorry. Uh, I thought I gave you the link for the for my Quizlet flashcards. I will ask Richard in the Bibliothèque section of the Apricot. I will give it to him right after this webinar. And if he doesn't mind, thank you. Uh, he will post the link. So you click the link if you have a Quizlet account and you can have access to my flashcards. There's a thousand. I'm gradually working on the second thousand. Uh, the reason you'll see a bit of repetition is halfway through, I used a different word list and I noticed that there was some repetition, but I thought, well, repetition is actually good for reinforcing learning, um, so that would be fine. Martin says he's been using Quizlet for some time. Excellent. You know, if you happen to be familiar with some of those additional features, uh, that would be great if sometime you want to share how to use them. And for the rest of the activities, when I finally get around or I find the resources I need to implement them, I will be really happy to discuss that in a webinar. I'm not there yet. Jennifer says she's not able to open the link. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. We'll get that settled uh, and it will be forthcoming. When I send out the email with the, with the link for the video and all of that, we'll be sure to include it in there, okay? You're very welcome. So uh, we covered half of what Dr. Cobb talked about in his webinar, March 25th. Okay, great. Ooh, thank you for sharing, Martin. I will have a look at that. And everyone else is welcome to look at his Quizlet material. Excellent, thank you. Uh, the next webinar, March 25th, we're going to go through Lex Tutor, how to analyze a text using it. There's a lot of features on his website, but if you know where to go, it's pretty straightforward and we'll look at how to, to interpret the results of that. I thank you very much for your participation today, for your questions and for your input. I'll open the floor to questions, but as for the presentation, um, thank you for watching. It's finished for now. Rishar will upload everything for you. It will be available soon. Thank you very much. You're very welcome.